Hi, today we're going to be talking about pathogenesis. We're going to talk about how pathogens try to fight their way past your immune defenses and try to stay around your body and eventually cause disease. So stay tuned. Hi, and welcome back. In several previous videos, we discussed the amazing power of our immune system. What we're gonna talk about today is how pathogens fight their way into your body and try to maintain a presence long enough where they can actually feed off of you and cause disease. We'll talk about what that looks like as well as what you experience in response to this invasion, as well as what happens in, term in cases of epidemics. So start. let's first start by identifying the two different types of pathogens that we're going to encounter. The first is what we would call a true pathogen. So a true pathogen is a microbe that's able to cause an infection even in a healthy host. Contrast this with an opportunistic pathogen, which requires you to be somewhat weakened in order for it to cause an infection. You need to be somewhat compromised. We talked about opportunistic pathogens when we talked about our normal microbiota. Recall that many of the species that live inside of us are perfectly fine as long as you remain healthy and able to keep their presence in, in check and keep them in control or to keep them in the right part of your body, but that they can cause an infection if they make it into parts of your body where they don't belong or if they're able to overgrow for one of several different reasons. Regardless of whether something is a true pathogen or an opportunistic pathogen, it's going to have to go through these five different stages in order to cause an infection. So the first stage in an infection is going to be what we refer to as the portal of entry. The portal of entry is the way in which something makes it past your first line of defense. It's the way that it makes it in. So for example, in the case of something like a foodborne pathogen, it's going to enter in through your mouth and through your digestive tract. In the case of something uh, like a bloodborne infection, it may make it through the skin. So through getting puncturing the skin could be a portal of entry. You could inhale it in the form of respiratory droplets. This is often the case uh, in, in airborne viruses such as, a, as the cold or or influenza, or in the case of the coronavirus. It could get in through your general urinary tract. Lots of different STDs make it in through this particular way. The bottom line is the first stage is it's got to find a way to make it past your first line of defense. It's got to make it into your body in some way, shape, or form, and into one of your tissues if it's going to cause an infection. The second step in, in the case of pathogenesis is going to be adhesion or attachment. It's got to find a way to stick there. So if it's something like a gut bacterium, like an E. coli cell, they can produce these structures called fimbriae, which are kind of like sticky hands that allow them to stick to the cells of the gut. Remember, you have something called gut peristalsis. Uh, once something enters your digestive tract, it really never stops moving and churning until it reaches the exit which of course is in the form of feces. E. coli have a way of, and lots of other GI bacteria have a way of colonizing your gut by sort of sticking to the surface through these fimbriae that they're able to produce. In the case of a virus, it's the viral spikes that allow them to attach to a cell surface receptor on one of their host cells. If you're a tapeworm, it's because you produce something called a scolex, which allows them to literally burrow themselves into whatever tissue they're going to adhere to. So there are lots of different ways that a microbe can attach itself and prevent itself from being moved from the, removed from the body from uh, either the first or the second line of defense. Now, once it's attached, once it's made it in the body and it's attached somewhere, or it's at least in the tissue where it wants to be, it now has to do something called immune avoidance. Remember, you have the second line of defense and eventually the third line of defense that are going to come along and try to physically remove that microbe and, and defeat it in the process of fighting off this particular invasion. It needs to find a way to avoid your immune system and reproduce and gain nourishment in the process of that. So there are lots of different ways this can happen. This could be through several different, uh, several different uh, factors, including the formation of capsules or slime layers. It could be because they're able to produce something called leukocytins, which are compounds that cells release that actually destroy your white blood cells. It could be through the re release of of certain exotoxins that can actually cause your cells to undergo your immune cells to undergo apoptosis in response to this. So there are lots of different ways that they can release these things, uh, to, from release these things that can make them uh, more or less pathogenic and fight their way off uh, and fight your immune system off. 
the fourth step is actually causing disease. So the thing you have to realize is it's not most bacteria or viruses. They're not trying to cause disease in you, but it's it's a response of your body that often contributes. So there, there are three ways that a pathogen can actually cause disease. One is they can directly cause it by releasing certain exotoxins or endotoxins. So if you recall, endotoxin is a lipopolysaccharide found on the outer membrane of uh, the outer plasma membrane of of gram negative bacteria. This can actually lead to uh, fever. It can trigger inflammation and cause a whole host of other problems, even endotoxic shock, which in and itself could be fatal. Exotoxins are actually typically proteins that are produced by many bacteria that actually directly target a cell or a tissue. So for example, tetanospasmin or cholera toxin or shiga toxin uh, or diphtheria toxin or botulin. These are all uh, exotoxins or proteins that bind to certain cell surface receptors that impact and cause disease. The second way cells can cause disease is directly through the release of exoenzymes. So for example, there are, there are uh, enzymes called mucinase, for example, that digest the mucus that makes up your intestinal lining that can cause disease, or they can produce exoenzymes that can damage uh, healthy cells or that, that allow them to sort of break down parts of your body for food uh, in, order to, in order to survive. So these exoenzymes can also trigger cell damage and they can also trigger uh, it manifest in the form of the disease uh, that this particular pathogen causes. The third way is actually indirectly. They don't directly cause disease, but the disease manifests as a result of your body's own immune response. So for example, when we talked about endotoxins, your body can actually be tripped and do endotoxic shock as a result of this. Your body triggers massive amounts of inflammation in response to this. It overreacts to the presence of endotoxin. Uh, another example of this could be what happens in the case of tuberculosis or in the case of pneumonia, when your body mounts an immune response that leads to massive amounts of inflammation in the case of pneumonia, which leads to a bunch of fluid beginning to build up in the lungs. Or in the case of tuberculosis, your body actually forms these things called caseous lesions, where it essentially cordons off the tuberculosis bacterium in the form of a hardened lesion. But in the result, damages the lung, makes it less able to actually uh, to be able to move oxygen and acquire oxygen into your body as a result of this. The fifth and final step for any pathogen is the portal of exit. Remember that pathogens need to be able to make it out of your body and make it into a new host. So the portal of exit can be lots of different things. They can come out in your feces in the case of uh, many gastrointestinal disorders. They can come out in your urine. They could come out in the form of respiratory droplets when you breathe or when you sneeze or when you cough. They could be transmitted through an arthropod vector from your blood. So for example, diseases like malaria that are transmitted by mosquitoes. So there are lots of different ways that pathogens can leave your body. They're not leaving so that you can feel better. They're leaving because they they need to make sure that at least some of their offspring make it to a new host so that the species can continue to propagate itself. Now, the ability of a, a pathogen to actually cause disease is often reflected in a term referred to as virulence. Uh, virulence is often measured in uh, something called the LD50 or the, the lethal dose at 50%. In other words, it's the number of, of bacteria or the number of viral particles required to kill about 50% of all experimental species. Obviously, the lower the LD50, the fewer uh, number of bacteria or viral particles needed to cause an infection or kill somebody, uh, is it makes it more or less virulent. This can be contracted with, uh, contrasted with something called the infectious dose, or ID50, which is the number of bacteria or viral particles to trigger uh, colonization of the host. Not necessarily kill the host, but to actually cause a disease. So obviously, the lower the LD50 or the lower the ID50, the more virulent a particular pathogen happens to be. Now, what do you experience when you are ill? So there are actually five stages that you go through as well that sort of correlate with what's happening as this particular uh, pathogen begins to infect your body. The first step in this is called the incubation phase. So the incubation phase is from the point of infection up into the point where you show signs or symptoms. And this can be measured in hours to several days to actually months in some cases or years in other cases. This is when you actually have the pathogen inside of you, but you're not actually manifesting signs or symptoms. The first signs and symptoms will be noticed in the second stage called the prodromal stage. So the prodromal stage is where you get these vague signs and symptoms of illness. And the prodromal stage can vary quite differently in length from a matter of hours to uh, a day or two. This is where you get those vague feelings of, of your sick. Like you wake up and 
you have a headache or you feel like your glands are swollen or you just feel body aches. You're like, I don't feel right. I don't feel well, but I don't know what it is yet. And that's the thing. The prodromal symptoms of most infections are very, very similar. So you can't really specify what's actually going on at this particular stage of the infection. The third stage follows the prodromal phase and it's called the illness phase. And this is where you're going to get the most, this is where the, the pathogen is replicating in its highest numbers. It's invading the specific tissues uh, that it's known to cause disease in. And this is where you're going to get the specific signs and symptoms of a disease. So, uh, so this is where you're going to get uh, diarrhea. You're going to get things like jaundice. You're going to get hemorrhages. You're going to get internal bleeding. You're going to get um, um, pneumonia. You're going to start seeing the specific uh, tissues that are going to denote a particular disease. This is typically where you're, where you're able to identify which particular disease a patient is suffering from or what disease that you have. You know, are you sneezing and wheezing? Do you have diarrhea? Are you coughing? Do you have body aches? All these specific signs of disease. And this is when the infection is really at its highest. This is when the pathogen is dividing its highest numbers. It's when it's causing the most problems in your body. Following this is what's referred to as the decline phase. And it's not called the decline phase because because you're declining it's because the illness is declining the decline phase is when your body's going to start getting back to normal the fever is going to break your vasculature is going to slowly return to normal your blood pressure will return to normal your pulse will return to normal as the inflammatory response begins to shut off and the cellular responses begin to shut down this will be followed uh hopefully shortly thereafter by the recovery phase or the convalescence phase. And this is where your body is now post-infection. Everything is returning to normal, uh, but you may still have the pathogen in your body. It hasn't been fully removed yet. Now, the thing to realize about infections is which stages, which of these five stages a, a, a pathogen is infectious during varies. Every, every disease, every pathogen has its own sort of profile. Some are contagious only during the incubation phase. Some are contagious throughout all five stages. Some are contagious through the first four, but they're not contagious during the convalescence phase. So what you need to do uh, as a clinician is to identify what particular infection a person has, what disease they're suffering from, and then that will help to guide when it's safe for a person to return to normal activities and so on and so forth. So for example, with coronavirus, one of the reasons why we ask people if they've potentially been exposed to wait to quarantine for 14 days to see if they develop signs or symptoms. It's simple. We know that for about for a period of zero to 14 days following exposure, they may be in the incubation phase. And we do know that individuals in the incubation phase appear to be contagious, even if they're showing no overt signs or symptoms. The last thing I want to focus on is epidemiology. So epidemiology is the study of the spread and causes of a disease within a population. So epidemiologists have lots of terms that they like to utilize. So for example, they might be talking specifically about the incidence. So the incidence is the number of new cases of an infection over a period of time. This is typically measured uh, by the number of cases over, for, per se, over about 100,000 individuals. This could be contrasted, for example, uh, by the prevalence. The prevalence is the percentage of individuals within a population that have actually been exposed to the disease over a given period of time. They also talk quite often about the morbidity rate and the mortality rate. So the morbidity rate is the number of people who uh, are uh, impacted or become sick with the disease uh, over a certain period of time. This is usually in, measured in the form of a percentage. Uh, so is the mortality rate. So the mortality rate is the number of people who uh, die over a given period of time uh, from a particular infection. So for example, uh, we know currently in the United States that the mortality rate in, in response to uh, coronavirus infection is right around two and a half percent in all cases. So uh, so the main time we talk about epidemiology is in the case of epidemics or in the case of COVID-19, we're talking about a pandemic. So there are three major types of epidemics that we have that we encounter. The first one is what's referred to as a point source epidemic. So a point source epidemic is when a bunch of people catch something from a, a single source. So uh, a great example of this could uh, be if somebody were to contract food poisoning uh, from at a single night at a restaurant. So if a restaurant serves some type of bad food, let's say it serves bad clams, and you end up with 250 people that have food poisoning, you trace it back to a single instance. They all ate clams at that restaurant on a given day. That's a point source epidemic. Uh, and next one is what's called a common source epidemic. So this is similar to a point source in that individuals are all going to get it from the same place, but it typically happens over time. So for example, uh, if, if people get ill from a pathogen that's found uh, in a water treatment plant, 
individuals who are received water from that water treatment plant will continue to get sick over a period of time, but you should be able to track it back to, at least epidemiologists are likely able to track it back to the single source where they continuously get contaminated, the common well or the common water treatment plant. The final type of epidemic is what's called a propagated epidemic, and this is one that's spread through person-to-person -person contact. Now, we used to use the, the example of influenza as, a, as an example of, of a propagated epidemic, but I think we're all quite aware of, uh, of a current uh, propagated epidemic that's been going on, and that's the problem with the coronavirus. It's spread from person to person, and those who are not immune to it are likely to contract it and potentially become ill from it. It's spread from person to person, and this is why it's called a propagated epidemic. These are the most serious ones because it's very, very hard to control the person to person spread of an infection uh, in most conditions. And that's why we're having such a hard time because people continuously spread it from one person to the next. We see this every year with influenza as well as colds, and we're seeing it now with COVID-19. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. Today we talked about uh, pathogenesis. We talked about how microbes are able to make it into our body and cause disease and what we experience when we get an infection. We've all been there. Uh, and, you know, so we all know what that feels like when we go through the prodromal phases and the illness phase and so on and so forth. Uh, and finally, we wrapped up with a brief conversation about epidemiology. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, I really appreciate it. I hope you guys learned a lot through all these videos about the immune system. Uh, and this is sort of the final video in our conversation about our immune system. Uh, so I hope you guys learned a lot. Thank you so much. And I'll talk to you real soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.